morning is to help us get our hearts turned to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much, God, that we can gather together with one voice and sing your praises, God. I just pray, Lord, that you would just help us, Lord, just to come before you, just to lay down everything, to come before you with an undivided heart, Lord. Just have your way today, Lord. We honor you, we praise you, we thank you, for you are good, God. Amen.
worthy of it all. Lord, all of our praise to you. Lord, we are thankful that we're able to gather here, out in the open. Thank you, Lord, for our church family. Thank you for our brothers and sisters around us today. Thank you that we're healthy, Lord. Thank you for this day. God, we are just uh, um, excited that it's raining on us right now. <laughs> Get under an umbrella, somebody. Uh, this too shall last for about a minute. And I'll stand back here with you guys. How about that? Woohoo! Listen, you're going to have a story to tell one day. I remember the time that we were out under the tree and it started to rain on us. Amen. And uh, like that. But, <clears throat> yeah. You want to get under number? You okay? Yeah, oh, it's coming, huh? All right. Uh, wow. Good thing we're having a baptism today because those people don't care, right? Yeah. Woo! Uh, we're going to talk about baptism in a few minutes. But um, before we do that, I was going to have us say hi to each other. Just kind of wave at people while you're uh, under your umbrella like that. I don't know what I don't know what to do right now. This is a, this is a first, right? It's like, yeah, yeah. You're like just pretend you're in Hawaii because it rains every day there, and then it's over, right? So, yeah. Like that. Well, um, let me tell you a couple things here, but I'll hold that, will you? While it's raining here, I wanted to uh, say a couple of things to us. We have an exciting day today, don't we? And uh, we're going to have a baptism. We're going to have communion together. I have three short sermons for you today. Um, but let me say this. Everything that Jesus has done throughout the millennia he's done for the church his bride we are the church not the building right i can't hear you look at somebody and say you're the church you're the church you're the church and so um we know the value of being gathered together like like today uh even in the rain and uh even though it's uh, we're together we're six feet apart or further uh, we're looking forward ahead to winter time when we're when it's raining and really cold outside right now it's raining and really warm outside and so our plan is this our plan is to go underground and um, a as it were so to speak we're planning to get small this fall and I shared that with you a little bit last week um, and so you'll be able to gather with a few uh, friends a few family members if you like that you know and you trust who are healthy and invite them to your home that is clean and sanitized, right? And the same people. And then we'll live stream the, the message into your home. And you guys can have church together. You can have hope at home. You can have church at home. And, um, and so that's our plan for this fall, this winter time when we're not able to meet, when it's raining worse than this. I think this is going to stop here in a few minutes. So hold steady. Um, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, and I think you would agree with this, that things are rapidly changing in our world. Uh, would you agree with that? If you agree with that, would you raise your hand and wave at me? Things are rapidly changing in our world. And the church as we've known it may be vastly different in the years to come. There is a major effort to reset everything around the world. And so let's be prepared. And I want to challenge you right now, starting right here, here, there, there, everywhere. I want to challenge you right now to be prepared. Build a network now with friends beyond your family, maybe one or two other families that you know and love and love you, uh, blood family, and, and have a thoughtful discussion about the future of the church. And if we have to go underground, so to speak, that you'll have a plan, okay? Because we might not be able to do this like this in, in the future. We just don't know. And so our theme is, is get small this fall. Okay? Get small this fall. And get a few people around you that you know and love and trust. And that, that you can have uh, a little kid run right through your uh, house. Like that. It will be like family like that. 
And so I'm going to invite uh, Diane and Josie to come up here. And we're going to do something special right now. Give it up for Diane and Josie. It's already starting to stop. It's thinning out right now. You want to stand down here? Sure. All right. Where's Josie? There she is. Come join me under the umbrella, Josie. Well, good morning, Hope Chapel. Those of you that have braved the weather and are here this morning, and those of you that are live on Facebook, good morning to you. Josie and I have the privilege of being involved with your kids, with our kids, family, children, youth, and young adults here at Hope Chapel, all the way from the nursery or little ones uh, we've been involved with over the years, all the way up to you. Yes, all the way up to, to post-college, and, and it's our burden this morning and our delight at the same time to recognize that your kids, our kids, are in a new season starting tomorrow, that there are going to be challenges that they face that none of us have already faced, none of us as parents and grandparents have had to do before. And so we're committed to praying for your kids, supporting our kids, uh, calling them, texting them, seeing them when we can. But this morning, we're going to take a minute and pray for them. Josie's going to pray for the, for the, all the way from the nursery on up to college age. And I want to say that I'm mm -hmm. concerned and burdened and honored to pray for those of you that are parents, that are grandparents, that are teachers, administrators, principals, working in the schools, you are challenged in ways that you've not been challenged before. And we are gonna be holding you up in prayer. We're gonna be supporting you as best we can, all of us in it together. I know for myself as a grandmother, I'm committed to helping my grandkids that are in elementary school to help them thrive during this season as well. And so we're all pulling together. We're all in this together. And so Josie's gonna begin by praying for the children and the youth and young adults, and then I'm gonna follow up with praying over the parents, administrators, teachers, grandparents, all family members that are involved in what tomorrow, a new beginning. And I believe that God has good things that it's new to us, but he's not unfamiliar with anything. He knows the future, he knows our tomorrows, and he is going to walk us through this season. And I believe that we're all going to see successful, bright, happy children as a result. They're gonna be in your homes more than ever. We're gonna be in homes more than ever. And God loves homes. And he's sending us all to our homes this fall to do great things. So will you join Josie and then myself? Um, so I just wanna ask that if you are going into preschool, kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, all the way up to college, will you stand up? If you are going back to school at all in any capacity, I see you guys over there sitting down, so just stand up real quick. Um, and two, if you're watching on Facebook and you are a, a student of any kind, if you are going into kindergarten for the very first time or if you are going back to college or you're going into high school, I want to pray for you. And I want to start off by saying this. You guys, your generation of students has faced things that your parents never faced. You went to school through power outages through fire, through smoke, through a pandemic. So really, this is just another thing on your list and you're gonna absolutely kill it. I know you are. And for the days that's really, really tough, like Diane said, we have each other's backs and we're a family. But I wanna pray for you. So, could we all just extend a hand towards a student that you see around you, anyone that is a student, we can all see him around, and join me in prayer. Dear Jesus, I lift up your kids to you, Lord. These students, that are going back to school in a way that's never been done before. Lord, I pray that you are just in every second of it, Lord, that you pave a way for them, Lord. I pray that you are in the technology that they're using, that you just help their laptops and their, their, their tools work, Lord. I pray that 
their studies come good, that you bless them with wisdom, Lord, that you bless them with patience, God, that everything they need, you would give it to them, Lord. I even pray just a covering of motivation over the students, Lord, that they would feel motivated to learn, that they would feel excited to learn, excited to go back to school. Lord, it's a, it's a privilege to get to learn. It's a privilege to have an education, Lord. And I just ask that the students feel that as they are able to go back to school just in a little bit of a different way, Lord. I pray that the excitement for them is there, that the drive to learn is there, that the tools necessary to learn are there, Lord. I ask that you're with them in their homes and their families every step along the way. I know how hard it is to be a student and to sit in front of a screen and listen, Lord, but I just ask that you open up their ears, Lord. You make it easy work for them. Lord, I just pray a covering over every single student, all the way from pre-K, all the way up to college, Lord, that you would protect them, you would take care of them, and you would hold them close. Amen. And so I'm going to ask that the students go ahead and have a seat. And now if you are a parent, a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle, a family member, a neighbor that is going to be involved in participating in this new season with homeschooling and with distance learning would you stand to any teacher that is here would you stand to any administrator anyone that's involved in the school systems if you're at home and you're on facebook watching and that's you would you stand parents teachers family members administrators and then would you reach out your hand those of us that are going to be praying with would you just stretch out your hand to these individuals that are entering new territory as well father thank you thank you that we are your children and you are our parent the most amazing father any child could ever hope or dream for and you instill in us as parents, as family, as members of your church, as your body, you give us wisdom when we don't have what we need. And you are the God of all wisdom. We thank you for this opportunity that you have given to every parent, every teacher, every administrator, every grandparent or aunt or uncle or anyone who is involved, that you are going to empower them to teach our children. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill homes across this county as they begin their school day every morning. Would your presence be filled in the homes and hearts of everyone? And Lord, would you draw families closer together as a result of this new season? God, would you do a powerful work in moms and dads? Would you help the teachers in ways that they've not had to function and work in the past? Would you give them a creative ideas? I pray that the computers would work, that our internet would be up and running, and that, God, you would do a miracle in homes across this county and across our nation and across the world. We believe that you're in this and that you have a plan for every one of us. And so we cry out to you for help. We want to do a good job. We want to be faithful to the task that's ahead. And we want to be effective for this next generation. And so we ask that you would go with us and surround us with yourself. I thank you, Lord, and believe that we are going to have testimonies in the future that are going to be powerful and so in faith i speak that over everyone here this morning in jesus name amen thank you thank you go ahead have a seat this morning i'm going to give you my first short sermon and uh, then we're going to have a baptism exciting, isn't it? I've never done this before. Have you forest? <laughs> like that. Uh, so, here we go. 
Uh, so three short sermons today. The water baptism, you know, that's one of two sacraments that uh, we have held over for 2,000 years in the church. Um, and we're going to participate in the second one as well today, and that's communion. And uh, if you'll look on your uh, Sunday Times, you'll see right at the top there, on the right-hand side, Matthew 28, 19. This is the, the, the why and the, the derivative here is, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And here's a great promise. Surely I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. So what is baptism? What is baptism? It's a powerful outward sign, a representation, an identification with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It is a proclamation as well. You're proclaiming something wonderful that God has done on the inside. You've experienced his forgiveness. You have purpose in your life. It is a point of obedience. Jesus said to get baptized. We just read it there in Matthew. And it's also we're following Jesus' example, right? Because he got baptized. John the Baptist baptized him. It reminds us of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And we remember that each, each time we have communion um, that we'll have here this morning. Jesus was taken down off of that cross. All of you that are getting baptized, can you can you see me? I'm going to step back out here and brave the elements here. Is that is when he was taken off of that cross? Remember, he was on a cross, and then he was laid in a tomb. And we're going to lay you down in the waters of baptism, okay? And you're going to identify with what Jesus did. He was laid in a borrowed tomb, but he didn't stay there. What happened three days later? Huh? Easter Sunday, he was, he was resurrection. He came up in newness of life. In baptism, we're identifying with Christ's death. And we consider ourselves dead to uh, sin. In baptism, just as Jesus was taken down and buried, so we are buried in the waters of baptism here. Uh, Andy, go ahead and take care of that, would you? In baptism, like Christ, we are also then raised up. As we come up out of the water, we're raised up in newness of life. Even so, we should walk in that newness of life. Know this, everybody, all of you that are getting baptism. Baptism does not save you. Baptism does not save you. It says you are already saved, and it's an outward sign of something that's happened on the inside with you. It's a representation. Something spiritual has taken place in your life, and you're living that out. You're going to live that out in your daily life. It's that outward proclamation. I belong to Jesus, both to all of us and to the spirit world, I believe, that I belong to Jesus. You're, you're going public with your faith. You're saying it to all these people. Baptism is like a, a wedding ring that you would wear. I've, I've had this on my finger for 44 years. And it, it says something. It's a symbol of something especially important that has taken place. It took place years ago that I belong to someone very special. And, and she, by the way, she's sitting right over there. And so we're gonna, we have several people that are going to get baptized. I'm going to need one of these microphones here in a second. If you're getting baptized, would you please come stand with me up here on the stage? Everybody that's getting baptized, would you guys give it up for them? Here. Can I have your microphone, please? Thank you. Okay. Same people. Come stand up here with me, please. This is Josiah. Come on, Josiah, up here. He's the linebacker for the... Uh... <laughs> Maria, come up here. Come on up on the platform here. Everybody up here, up here, up here, up here, up here, up here, up here. And I'm going to interview you first. Can you, uh, you want to talk through that? Can you tell everybody your name? Um, I'm Sally Hong. Sally Hong. <laughs> This is her fan club that is here. And um, what brings you to this point to want to get baptized? Well, before I started coming to Hope Chapel, I wasn't really ever that close with God. And I was always like, I would go to church because my parents were going to church. Then when I started coming to Hope Chapel and youth group here, I really started to like get really close with God and learn like what it means to be a Christian. And um, yeah. Yeah, and so now is 
the next right step. Amen. All right. Thank you. Can you give it up for her? Hi, what's your name? Hi, everyone. My name is Melina. Melina. Yeah, this is her fan club over here. All of you watching in Fiji right now, this is Melina. So, uh, like Pastor Dan said, uh, this is the right step towards uh, the next step. The next step, yeah. And I'm ready for our God to lead me on my new chapter in life uh, as, as a Christian, as a, a young woman growing up. Uh, I never used to feel like I was worthy enough, uh, unequipped, as they say. But uh, now that I'm coming to church, and I know there's really not a right time to give our life to God and get baptized, and I'm ready. You're I'm ready. ready. All right. Oh, God, what <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And who is this young lady here? What's your name? Maria. Yeah. I just have to tell everybody, hold that real close to your mouth, that I went to Fiji with Maria when she was two years old. And how old are you now? Uh, Eleven. Eleven? You're making an old man out of me. <laughs> just right here. So what brings you to this point that you want to get baptized? Hold uh, it real close. Um, I want to take, um, I want to take what, my, uh, my love for God to the next level, to like to the next step. Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. This is going public. All right. This is the man here. Hold that real close up here. What's your name? Josiah. Josiah Rao. Josiah Rao. Josiah Rao. Look at those people back in Fiji. You can see them. You can see them through that nature. <laughs> and what brings you to this point, Josiah, that you want to get baptized? Uh, since I know uh, God for so long, I'm ready for the uh, to take the next step. To a new level, yeah, and get a strong relationship with them. Yeah, get a strong relationship with the Lord. Okay, yes. well, let's do it. You ready? Yes. All right. Let's uh, can we all uh, here, um, Tanya? Would you just stretch your hands out here? We're going to pray for these folks, and then we're going to go walk right over here. We're going to baptize them, and get your cameras out. This is a great uh, photo op. Jesus, I just thank you for. Um, each one of these, Lord, these, these brothers and sisters in the Lord, uh, you're doing something in their life. Lord, first of all, you saved them. Lord, you, you've seen uh, their heart. You know what's going, in, going on on the inside of them, Lord. And so we want to affirm that. We want to be obedient to your word. Lord, as they go down in the waters of baptism, I pray that they come up in newness of life, Lord. They come up with strength, that you put uh, strength in their back, Lord, that they're able to stand for you all the days of their life, to serve you all the days of their life, and to, to lead others to you, Lord Jesus. And so, God, we ask your blessing on them today as we baptize them. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, let's go do it here.
Amen. It was exciting times. <clears throat> Wonderful time. You know, you'll see on your bulletin there that there's a scripture from James. Now is when I need my Bible. Now you can, uh, you guys can sit down. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> you'll see the scripture there in James. We're going to read that here in just a second. If you would open your Bibles or turn your device on, uh, <clears throat> you can... Uh, follow along in James chapter 3. We're going to finish chapter 3 this morning in a brief message. I told you I had three messages. This is number two. And, and then when we talk about communion here in a minute, that'll be number three. And so open your Bibles to James chapter 3. If you're watching at home, you can do that as well. Last week we talked about the tongue. <clears throat> And the tongue is the only thing, the only instrument, if you will, 
that the mind and the heart possess to express itself, whether it's good or bad, right? And by the way, it is located appropriately uh, right in between uh, the mind and the heart, right? That's where your tongue is located, as you know. And we know that without a command from the mind and permission from the will, the tongue cannot do much, whether it's good or bad. I don't know if you saw the little Facebook post that we, I did this week. I asked you this question. I'm going to ask it again to you today. Have you had to bite your tongue this week? Is it, uh, I better not say that. Huh? Being able to control the words that come out of your mouth. And so today we're going to pick it up in James chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. If you follow along, if you have your phone, uh, look, and, or if you have the scripture there on the Sunday Times, uh, if you're following along at home, we're in James chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you? He starts off with a question. Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. The humility that comes from wisdom. And here's here, verse 14 starts with a transition. But if you harbor bitterness, envy, and selfish ambition in your hearts, you do not boast about it, do not boast about it, or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspirit, uh, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have, listen, look at these nasty things here. Where you have, what? Envy, selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Wow. Verse 17, but the wisdom that comes down from heaven is first of all pure, and then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Look at verse 18, peacemakers, are you a peacemaker? Will sow in peace and reap a harvest of righteousness, of, of rightness, if you will. And so, wisdom, he says there in verse 13, go back to verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you wisdom what is it who has it and how do we get it the word wisdom comes from the greek word sophia anybody here named sophia that means you, you're wise huh and uh, there's another greek word that's used but uh it's a little bit different and it's uh <clears throat> for Nessus. but sophia means uh, insight into the true nature of things and phonesis means prudent and understanding or it's kind of the practical side uh, of wisdom. And so I'm going to take you a little bit deeper right now, so I need you to hang on for about three and a half minutes as I explain something, because uh, it'll help us in the rest of the message here to go a little bit deeper here, to help us understand wisdom now, is in the Gospel of John, it says that Jesus Christ is the Word. The Word became flesh. How many of you know that in John chapter 1, right? And <clears throat> That word there is logos, L-O-G-O-S. And it has the meaning of, of, of expression. And so Jesus is the expression of the eternal God in human form. Why? So we could understand him. Wisdom, the word wisdom is a synonym for logos. Did you catch that? Of the word. And it is talking about perfection and eternity found in God and is manifest in Jesus and in, and is in the world today by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that lives in you. If you're a Christ follower, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Why am I telling you this? It's because we need to keep in mind the meaning of the word wisdom to understand the question that James is asking. Did you see? He started with a question this morning. He says, who is wise and understanding among you. If a person thinks that they're wise and knowledgeable, James, James is challenging them, and he says this, let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. He insists that, that there needs to be proof of faith that you profess. Now, I know probably everybody here has seen one of these movies on TV, a ransom movie. Have you seen a ransom movie like that? And they say, okay, I want, I want proof of life. Are they still alive? 
like that. Well, here he's asking for proof of faith. Don't merely say in so many words, you know, yeah, I'm wise. Prove it by your actions. Is Christ really living in you? As a follow, Christ follower, you have completely different mode of life than someone who's outside of Christ. See, Christ dwells in us. His goodness and His grace lives in us, and that is what we give out every day in our life and in our, our, our actions in our service to other people. Like there's a reservoir in us that we draw from, and as you use it up, what's in that reservoir we must refill it constantly. Constantly. Ephesians 5 says, Be filled with the Spirit. This is why your daily time with the Lord is so, so important. And I hope it's just not a mechanical thing that you do, but that somehow you transition into that, it, let it connect with your heart. And that's hard. Because you go, oh man, i got to go. School's starting right now. Or, you know, whatever, whatever. S stuff's going on. But to make that time to press in and connect and to get filled up, to pray in the Spirit, use your spiritual language to be built up in your inner person, strengthened on the inside. Fill your reservoir. Look at verse 13 again. It says, let them show it by their good life, deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Remember who James is writing to. He's writing to Christians that have been forced out of town. They've been scattered across the known world. Why? Because of their faith. They are being persecuted for their faith. Listen, our Christian brothers around the world in places like Iraq and Somalia and Sudan and China are being persecuted even today. They're being chased. Keep that in mind as we're talking about this wisdom this morning. How does someone show God-given wisdom? Wisdom given by God, by battling through those terrible circumstances and not kind of blown out a crack somewhere, but moving through all the upset, all the disorder, all the disappointments, the chaos of it all. It, God is working something in our life, even today. You know, we hold that scripture in Romans 8, you know, about all things work together for good. Yeah, you guys all know that. And that's a tough one, even in the middle of COVID-19, right? Wisdom and goodness shows up in our lives. There's an expectancy coming out of our life. There's hope in us. There's solidness in us. There, there, we're not freaking out because God's in charge. Do you believe that God's in charge? Yeah. Go to verses 14, 15, and 16. He says, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it <laughs> or deny the truth that it's there. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you have disorder in every evil practice. This is what happens if someone expresses their wisdom without humility. Listen, if there's bitterness in your heart, you know what? It's going to come out your mouth. Have you bumped anybody that's bitter lately? You know, you just touch them the wrong way, and all of a sudden, <laughs> right? It's just below the surface, just just right there. Selfish ambition, self bitter zeal. Bitterness and zeal are the same Greek word in the New Testament. Zeal that embitters others is called jealousy. Let me give you a couple of examples. There's a New Testament example. The Jewish leaders boiled over with zealous. Uh, was zeal, in the King James it says, for their form of religion, and were jealous that the apostles were so successful. Let me give you a current day illustration. This can even happen in our church today, that, that our form of church, our ecclesiology, you guys learned that word on Wednesday, right? Right, ecclesiology. Our form of church, I mean, it's the best. We're better than everybody else. Right? Zeal that embitters. Someone asked, how's your church doing during COVID-19? Oh, uh, it's sad. I mean, we're in really a bad way. The, the church is slipping. 
it's getting worse all the time. But thank God, uh, none of the other churches are doing well either. <laughs> that, that's bitter zeal. That's rivalry. Zeal that embitters others. Are you tracking with me? Zeal that embitters others. So we're talking about two kinds of wisdom. Everybody hold up two fingers. There's two kinds of wisdom. There's earthly, unspiritual, godless wisdom, and then there's godly wisdom. Such wisdom, he says in verse 15, the, the, the bitter zeal kind, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is it's the natural realm. It's earthly. It's man-made, uh, unspiritual. For where you have envy, what's envy? I want what you have. Uh, where you have envy and selfish ambition, it's about me, there you'll find disorder in every evil practice. There are two kinds of wisdom that originate from two different places. Two different places. And James contrasts the false wisdom and the divine wisdom. He says that earthly wisdom does not come down, does not, underline that, does not come down from above. Flip the coin over. Meaning that divine heavenly, godly wisdom does come from above. Continuously. There's an inexhaustible supply. It's a renewable spiritual resource that you can never use up, you can never wear out. Right, somebody say amen to that. We have a constant need for wisdom from God. How often have you prayed for wisdom? Wisdom from above. Lord, what should I do? I don't know what to do. Help me, Lord. And you know what? That wisdom comes as you step out in faith. I don't know. Should I say this? This morning, it was raining, right? How many were up at 4 or 4.30 this morning? You know, the whole nine yards. And, you know, about the time 7, 7.30 rolls around, 7.45, I start getting texts and phone calls. Are we doing church today? I don't know, man. Ah! And so I spoke in faith. I said, by 10 o'clock, it's going to clear up. Well, it almost did. <laughs> but hey, it's perfect right now, right? This night. You got to step out. You got to, uh, I don't know. That's me. I'm a risk taker. So James gives us three characterizations of wisdom that does not come from above. He said it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Spiritual, that word there is suke. It's where we get our word psychology and psychiatry. Is commonly translated soul. And so the, that inanimate part of us that, that animates the, the material part of us. But then he said, however, earthly, man-made wisdom does not put us in touch with God, the true giver of wisdom. And then he says it's demonic, it's demon-like. It's, it's, it, it, there, there can be a, 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 an unnatural uh, property to it, a, able to deceive people and, and cause confusion. You know, one of the tricks of Satan is to cause confusion to what true wisdom is or is not. Then in verse 16, he says, disorder or confusion uh, of every evil practice. With true wisdom, there is humility and a godly life. There's humility and a godly life. So how do you know which is which? By its fruit. Look at the fruit. I know many of you have fruit trees in your yard. How many have a fruit tree in your yard? How do you know it's a peach tree? Because there are... How do you know it's an apricot tree? Because there are... How do you know it's a lemon tree? Okay, by their fruit, right? We know a tree by its fruit. And <clears throat> confusion, when you see confusion and strife and envy and disorder, that's the fruit. That's the fruit. That's not godly fruit. God is not a God of confusion, 1 Corinthians 14 says. So what's interesting is that, that those who propagate false wisdom do it with great enthusiasm, with great zeal. And they're persuasive and they're passionate. And, I mean, this is how, how, how cults get started. There's a persuasive, you know, passionate speaker. Right now, I just, I just found out last week, last week I just found out, you got you guys in Fiji, you know there's a new cult in Fiji right now. And they are saying that Jesus was born in Fiji. That's not a bad place to be born, but that's not true, <laughs> right? Huh? And Adam and Eve, and all, all, uh, I'm not going to go any further with that. But, but they're passionate, you know, and they're getting press, and people know about it and stuff like that. 
Okay, here's a second type of wisdom. Look at verses 17 and 18. See, but, this is my favorite word in the whole Bible, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all what? What's the word? Pure. I can't hear you. Pure. pure. The wisdom that comes from heaven is pure. You're not like recoiling. You're not like, eh. First of all, it's pure. It's peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. We're talking about two kinds of wisdom. Have you got wisdom today? Will that be the headline of your life this year? Boy, in the honor, she's wise. Leanne, Brady, Justin, you that are watching, is that going to be the headline of your life? You see, all of what James talks about in the fruit that is, 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 comes out in our life, the fruit that's coming out of your life, what is the fruit of divine wisdom? It's pure, it's peace-loving, it's considerate, and so on and so forth. Are, aren't all of these things uh, internal qualities? So it follows that if the heart is not pure, there can be no pure actions. You remember Jesus said in the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Let me say this, the Christian life begins with the acceptance of Jesus Christ by faith into your heart. When you do that, you can be counted wise. Why do I say that? Because you had enough sense not to reject him. What happens when we invite Jesus into our heart and, and ask him to save us? Now follow this. Put your thinking cap on. Come back here, right, right here. Because we know that our hearts are unclean, right? There's, there's stuff in there. There's sin in there. That's why, here's a little caveat. That's why people who say follow your heart are misguided. Because it, they're not telling you that there's dark stuff in there. There's bad stuff in there, right? Rather, follow God's word. So, God and sin do not go together. They cannot coexist. Before he can come into your heart, he must do something that only, that he's the only one who can do it. He's the only one that can do it. And that is to cleanse us from all sin. And if you've experienced that, you know how wonderful that is when he just lifts that heavy load. It's like a, it's like a backpack that's just filled with rocks. And you get to take that off and lay it at his feet and he deals with that. How does he purify our hearts? Well, there was a payment that had to be made on the cross to pay for our sins. That's why Jesus died on the cross. He paid for our sins. His blood poured out to wash away our stain. When this happens, we're pure. When we receive him, we're pure for that moment. Now note this. There's an initial cleansing and then there's a continual cleansing. Why do I say that? Because we live in a dirty world. Would you, anybody say that's right? Huh? We live in a dirty world. We're exposed to dirt. Uh, and uh, Our exposure to dirt is inevitable and to a large extent unavoidable. Did you notice that all of these qualities that we've talked about, all this fruit that we've been talking about, it's all internal? It's all a heart thing? peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, right? Impartial, sincere. God wants our heart. Before he can come in there, we have to surrender to him and say, you're right, I'm wrong. Verse 18, our last verse. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Reap the harvest. I long for that. That, that rightness, goodness, if you will, right living. The word righteousness could also be translated justice. Righteous living is only possible if we have a righteous heart. A righteous heart is only possible through the acceptance of the wisdom from above. That wisdom is Jesus Christ. And even to receive communion today in an authentic way, it, we want to take communion in an authentic way right and that is to first say yes to Jesus to admit your sin and ask him for his 
forgiveness. Have you crossed that line of faith? Have you stepped in and said, yes, Lord, I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm yours. Forgive me, Lord, I sinned against you. Come into my heart. Save me. We're going to pray, and then we're going to have communion. The worship team is going to come up. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Now I'm going to encourage you, if, you, if you've not done that, if you're not sure, if Jesus were to show up tonight, if you would go with him, if you're not sure, then would you pray this prayer, just whisper this to the Lord, say, Dear Lord, Dear Lord, I humble myself and ask you to forgive my sins. Come into my heart and save me. God, save me from myself. Save me, Lord. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose again on the third day. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Just say that. Jesus is is Lord. And God, I just want to receive all the forgiveness, all the cleansing, Lord. Right now, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Can you say amen with me? Amen. amen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> here's sermon number three. You ready? Okay, that was number two. This is number three. Uh, we're going to have communion together. And uh, Team Hope, can you come up and get ready? Go ahead and get the baskets. And the way that they're going to do this, they're going to walk up to you and say how many in your party, and then they're going to hand the communion to you. Don't put your hand in the basket, okay? Just tell them how many you have, and they'll do that. Jerry, can you come help them? We have three baskets here. <clears throat> And so communion at uh, Hope Chapel is open. You don't have to be a member here. Uh, we're going to need a few minutes. You guys can make some noise there. Um, there are people sitting in their cars, Forrest, uh, Mike, Jerry. Uh, make sure you get to the cars. So we're going to need a couple of minutes. And would you use this time? The scripture says that we're to examine ourselves before we receive communion. Okay? Would you just take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit... Go ahead, close your eyes, prepare your heart. Say, Lord, is there anything I need to confess to you this morning? Just humble yourself. If you're watching online, humble yourself and ask the Lord. use this time between you and the Lord to express your love to him, your devotion to him, your obedience to him. And just as we do this, we're just going to take a few moments and just allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Maybe you need to get your Umbrella opened up. Move under the tree. You guys are all brave souls. I love it. Pioneers. Standing firm in the Lord. Yes, Lord.
For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We proclaim his death. Jesus died for us until he comes. He's coming again. Jesus is coming again. And he's going to take his bride with him to live with him for eternity. So then, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, do it in a worthy manner. Do it in an authentic manner. Be real with the Lord today. There are two things that we need to be aware of when we receive communion today. One is it's appropriate for us to come with humility, repentance, and reverence. That's good. A time to remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross for us. The huge, horrific, painful, unbelievable price that he paid for us. And the second thing is this. It's also a time of celebration and thanksgiving. That's what Eucharist means. It means the thankful. We eat this little cracker. We, we drink this juice with gratefulness for God's amazing love and salvation he provided for us. Remember the huge price that was paid for us. Jesus defeated death and hell, and he secured our freedom from guilt and shame. And so communion is a celebration of victory in that way, in that way. So I don't know, do we, did all you in the cars, Pete, did you get some? Did you get communion? You're good? Marianne? All right. Okay, now parents, you get, if your kids are going to have communion, you're going to have to help them because this is a little tricky, right? All right, would you go ahead and take the top layer off and get the little wafer out? When you have it, would you just hold it up with me like this? That we acknowledge the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for willingly going to the cross, suffering the shame and the pain. But in that, Lord, you broke the penalty and the power of sin. We no longer are slaves to sin. We're free. We're free. We're free. And we celebrate that this morning. Thank you for giving your life for us. Let's eat. Go ahead and open the cup carefully. This cup is a new covenant, a symbol of the blood of Jesus that was poured out on the cross. Lord, we hold this up before you today, receiving the grace, the mercy, the kindness, the goodness, the forgiveness, the joy, the hope, the purpose that only you can give. Thank you, Lord. We're grateful today. Let's drink. Thank you. We're going to finish up this morning with a, with a wonderful song and uh, Team Hope is available. The tithe box is up here. Um, so so proud of you for hanging in there and coming out today and uh, being here with us today. Uh, take serious what I said about building a network and having a serious discussion with another family that you're good friends with already. Make a plan. Make a plan. We're going to take the church underground in a few months, so be ready for that. Let's sing this next song.
Bless you, Hope Chapel. Have a great week.